Welcome to the uh, evening session. Eh, bienvenidos a la sesión de, de la tarde. Eh, ya es la última, así que vamos a, a, este, a terminar esto hoy para que tengamos luego nuestra fiesta en blanco. Eh, en esta sesión eh, tengo el honor de invitar a que nos dé la plática la doctora Don Buckingham. Y Don, please, join us. Y quiero hablar un poquito de Don porque eh, la, de la importancia, bueno, ella además es una excelente amiga, eh, pero quiero hablar de la importancia de lo que ella hace. I'm going to speak in English and Spanish to introduce you. So Don is uh, one of my lovely, great friends, but I want to mention like what she does and the, and the position she has. Y, lo importante que es para nosotros haberla recibido aquí. Don es cirujano coloplástica, pero después, además de ser cirujano coloplástica, entró a la política. Y primero, en el estado de Texas, fue senadora del estado, en una competencia muy intensa en, entre dos republicanos y ganó ella su estado, su, 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 su región. Y después, no conforme con haber sido senadora de, de, del Estado, decide ahora correr por una posición que es el Texas Land Commissioner. El Texas Land Commissioner, la importancia para ponerla una en perspectiva, porque luego uno no, no, no entiende las perspectivas, imagínense que el, antece, el antecedente que hubo antes de ella la tenía la posición Jeff Bush, el hermano de George Bush una posición muy importante en el estado de Texas. Es la quinta posición en importancia después del, del gobernador, etc. Tiene un presupuesto de más de 3 billones de dólares. B con B de bueno. Y, y se encarga de ver más de 13 millones de acres, que es más grande que una cantidad enorme de países en el mundo. Ve todo lo, de, eh, eh, lo del petróleo y lo del gas en Texas, y también se encarga de ver de todas las cuestiones eh, de desastres naturales. Entonces, como pueden imaginarse, tiene un trabajo extraordinariamente ocupado y encima de eso nos viene a donar su tiempo. Eh, estoy muy, muy contento de tener aquí a Don. So thrilled about having you here. I said it in Spanish, I won't say it again in English, but I just said all the wonderful things that you do already for the state and that you're, we are just honored that you are taking time to be here with us and to share your, 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 uh, your lecture with us. La plática es un poco diferente, y este, pero escúchenla, y thank you, Don. No, Welcome. Thank you, Jorge. And a big round of applause for Jorge, right? What a great president y'all have. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the whole... The whole basis of my talk is the world is relational. And this is just a little history of ophthalmology. Y'all know we've been around a long time um, through many technological advances. But I tell you what, doctors have been in leaderships in almost every country across the globe. You know, we've had presidents in, um, in Brazil, and you can see Syria, Chile, Malawi, we have doctors in leadership in the United States, in the U.S. Congress, in our Senate, our state leaderships. And so naturally, we show up in leadership. And as said, and this is from one of the, the doctor politicians, like when you're a physician, everyone believes you, right? When you're a politician, no one believes you. So I'm sort of in that zone between politician and physician, so y'all can decide if you can believe me or not. But um, it makes it fun. But we are natural politicians. We're natural leaders because we're already having to work on managing our time. We already have to work in diverse groups, and we have to make quick decisions under pressure and take care of our patients. So, you know, my path to politics started early. I finished my residency training, and I figured out very quickly that the government impacts healthcare. And in my opinion, the government was negatively impacting healthcare. So I sought leadership positions in my state, my local, my national, my international organizations. 
you know, was pre one of the first presidents of the Texas Ophthalmological Association, was the first woman to be, to chair the Council on Legislation for the Texas Medical Association. I sat on our OFPAC board. I went through the American Academy of Ophthalmology Leadership Development Program. And, and then through that became an advocate and became so well known actually nationally and and my politics were pretty clear, and I forgot I had a slide from a Trump rally in here, but I'll try and keep the politics out of it a little bit more. But I felt like government-controlled health care was really not a good thing for our patients. And so I became an advocate against Obamacare when Obama was trying to pass that. And um, so much so that Bloomberg News sent a reporter down to Texas just to interv interview me and be like, why is Texas so viscerally against this? And so that path um, just kept snowballing. And so pretty soon... You know, we're, we're doing, um, I'm getting appointed by the Governor Perry at the time to, to serve on, an, on a statewide commission. Lieutenant Governor appointed me to something. And then it kept snow, snowballing. And I figured out very, very quickly that you just keep going. The best way to take care of your patients is to be active in, um, in politics. So... Let's see, let's go here. So you can kind of see, you know, if you're thinking about running for office, which I would tell you, you at a minimum to take care of your patients and advocate for your patients, you need to be a member of your medical, or, or medical organizations, you need to give to your PACs, you need to know your candidates. When you're thinking about running for office, you have to think about things like, does your political party know who you are? Are you already a leader in medicine? Will the doctors rally around you? Will the House of Medicine rally around you? How much money do you have to raise? My first race was $2 million race. Um, we had saved a half a million dollars because I knew I was going to run at some point, and I threw in another half a million dollars, so we were a million in personally for my first race, and then we raised the extra million. So this stuff is very expensive, and it definitely takes time away from your practice and your ability to... Uh, this is a, the Trump rally picture. Sorry, I forgot about the thing on the bottom. But um, so pretty soon I ran for my school board in 2014. And then in 2016, my Senate seat was open. My Senate seat represents um, 800,000 people. It was 20,000 square miles of the heart of Texas, which is actually bigger than nine states. And so, um, and Texas is the 10th largest economy in the world. So actually, Texas's economy alone is bigger than Russia. And so this is me and my son. And and my husband, I'm getting sworn in for the general land office, but ran for the Senate and won, ran statewide in Texas in just last year. So I'm the first woman to ever hold this office. It actually um, predates the governor. So our, when, we were, when Texas was transitioning from a sovereign nation into a state, we had to figure out who owned what. So the general land office was founded. So today, we steward 13 million acres. I have a two point $3 billion budget. I've written $2 billion in checks to public education this year alone. We're responsible for the majority of oil and gas in the state, which is responsible for 40% of oil and gas in the country. Um, and so it is a big job and it is a lot of fun. But I just want y'all to know, be active and engaged in politics. It affects everything around you. And when your politicians around you, they're just looking for friends. So be a friend, help them in your office, let them come phone bank, but get to know them and then be their trusted advisor because as the physician, they're gonna believe you. And believe me, there are lots of other medical practitioners and others out there who wanna tell them what is not best for our patients. So change the world, thanks for having me and God bless y'all. Ahora tengo el honor de presentar a una muy querida amiga, Ángela. Y la razón por la que la invité a Ángela es, ella vive en Dallas, es originaria del Paso, pero aunque ella no me deja decirlo, yo lo digo, es como tener una Michelangelo en la vida actual, porque ella hace unas cuestiones artísticas impresionantes. Entonces, nos va a dar una plática. Yo también no sé exactamente de qué va a ser la plática, pero sé la calidad de su trabajo y sé que esto va directamente relacionado a lo que todos hacemos. Como decía José Raúl, porque al final del día, todos somos artistas. Ah, 
Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you, fellow artists. When I was asked, oh, in fact, sorry, my daughter is walking around giving all of you some of my plastilina clay. So this is the medium with which I work every day in the studio. I think that you will find when you take it into your hands, and I hope you will right now while we're together, and warm it up a little bit, it is quite pleasant to work with. And I think you will also find it quite different from, from the medium that you normally use in your practice. So when I was asked to speak to you, my fellow artists, I, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, how can I share, what can I share with a group of talented, highly specialized physicians? And so, of course, I sought ways in which we might connect through our artistry, our purpose as sculptors, and as storytellers. And I realized that we definitely share a responsibility to honor our subjects, your patients, my subjects. I also... Um, humbly admit that I have the freedom to make mistakes all the time in my work. And so I can simply take a mallet hammer, bang a knee, readjust, and re-sculpt. So I have to remind myself all the time to keep humility ever-present in the studio with me. In your work, you require precision all of the time. So as artists, humility really is on your side, and I admire you for that. Okay, I already forgot to change my slide. I'm sorry. This is one of my sculptures, Arise, which I made using the very plastilina clay that you're, you have in your hands, which was later molded and cast into a bronze sculpture, a limited edition. So I'm going to take you back with me to about 25 years ago. I was pushing my double stroller with my two toddler daughters through a quaint neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called Shadyside. And in Shadyside, there are wonderful Victorian homes, exquisite boutiques, and art galleries. And it was in one of those art galleries where I first encountered the work of one of my contemporaries, Richard McDonald. His figurative sculpture for its dynamic movement, it, it impressed me tremendously. One detail, however, drew me into his work, into all of his pieces, and it was the, the detail and complexities of the ears. The art gallery director noticed how drawn I was to these ears, these bronze ears, and so she came up to me and she said, do you know what? I noticed you're really looking at those ears. Well, Richard McDonald's best friend happens to be, yes, a plastic surgeon who specializes in the reconstruction of the ears. So I was enchanted. I couldn't believe it. My goodness, Richard McDonald for years had had the opportunity to observe his friend operating on delicate tissue in real life a world-class opportunity for any artist who wants to learn about, or any sculptor especially, who wants to learn about ears. Twenty-five years later, guess what happened? My very good friend, Dr. Jorge Corona, invited me to observe him in his OR performing surgery. What an honor. Jorge's first patient of the morning was an 11-year-old little girl with what I believe is referred to as drooping eyelid. And what just what struck me was the trust, as she was rolled into the OR, the trust that her parents were placing in their doctor and the responsibility that he had to them and to their daughter and to use his instincts to honor what nature likely had intended when her eyelids were first forming. So up close, I got to see those layers. Oh, the layers and the muscles and, and the little fat pockets in real life. And Jorge would ask his 
anesthesiologist to give a little more sedative and then a little less, asking and then instructing his young patient to open her eyes and look directly into his own. Oh, yes. So she'd close them again, back asleep, and Jorge would make his adjustments. His skill and knowledge was fascinating, but what truly took my breath away was the collaboration between the two, between Jorge and his patient. Everything, the center of everything was between their eyes and all else existed on the periphery, of course, including myself and the anesthesiologist. I just changed that, right? Yes? Okay. Sorry. So my appreciation for my friend's artistry was truly a pivotal revelation for me. I observed in awe as Jorge meticulously engaged his spatial awareness, a balancing act between the visual information of her internal structures and his recognition of, her, of the visual pathways When I returned to the studio that afternoon, every molecule in my body was sizzling. I was so inspired by what I had just witnessed, what I'd experienced that day. I had actually stayed through numerous surgeries. At the time, I had a sculpture in the works in my studio. Her name is Riley. Her sculpture name, finished here in clay, is Tomorrow's Glory. Riley's grandmother had entrusted me to create a composition of Riley, carte blanche, that would be an honest depiction of who Riley is. But after my experience of that morning, I, I saw the sculpture differently. I went up to the sculpture and looked into the eyes of this clay little girl really hoping to hear that silent language that I had witnessed Jorge share with his patient that morning. I wondered how I might refocus and find her center, find her balance. So I've been sculpt I have actually sculpted my entire life. My mother says I started with my mashed potatoes in my high chair. Professionally, I've been sculpting for decades, so I have definitely enjoyed the comfortable self-assurance that I'm an expert in my field. But after that day, I was reminded that my most valuable gift is not my expert training, it's not my years of experience or my titles behind my name. My gift, Jorge's gift, your gift is your intuition as observers of life. So in my studio, I can have all the training in the world but still miss the mark of who my subjects are if I'm not in tune with their center, with the very fabric of their identity, with how they see themselves and how they hope to be seen. I'm going, to get, I'm going to read this so I can be sure to get this right. What doctors can learn from looking at art. An editorial for the New York Times by Dr. Drev Kuhler explores the practical application of artistic acumen in a medical setting. In the early 2000s, Dr. Erwin Braverman, a professor of dermatology at Yale, pioneered a teaching method of systematic visual training. Dr. Braverman's idea was to have his students analyze and consciously connect with representational art to enhance their visual diagnostic skills. Students who took Dr. Braverman's course proved to be more likely to recognize important subtleties in their patients' conditions, and the initial success of his alternative teaching approach inspired medical schools across the United States to incorporate fine art in their curriculum. Namely, Dr. Joel Katz, the director of 21 years for Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School's Internal Medicine Residency Program, 
followed suit with his own course called Training the Eye, the Improving the Art of Physical Diagnosis for First and Second Year Medical Students. Dr. Katz's students were led to contemplate visual concepts, symmetry, texture to form, motion. These case-by-case -case insights taught the students to consider evidence from various points of view, a crucial diagnostic step in order to confirm the absence of anomalies or to sometimes find disruptions in likely patterns. And to quote Dr. Katz, ambiguity is inherent in art and in medicine, in both we have to avoid prematurely narrowing our thinking. So there's a museum in Lausanne, Switzerland, Collection de l'Art Brut, and Brut in French means bra. The collection is four floors of raw art created by artists from all over the world spanning over 200 years. The artists all share a common thread they were either marginalized, detainees, or prisoners, and many were criminally insane. The raw emotion in this museum is so heavy, you can feel it on your shoulders as you contemplate each piece. The museum houses the artwork of Michel Nedjar, the son of Algerian and Polish immigrants to France. He became an apprentice to his father, a master tailor at age 14. He had a passion for old garments, their smells and their textures. But at age 21, he contracted tuberculosis, which was an experience that brought to, to his understanding the realization of his own mortality. So suddenly, and it was a very important shift in perspective for this young man, suddenly fabric as fashion became meretricious and futile. So he decided to start making doll-like sculptures out of these old garments by soaking them in dye baths and animal blood, something that he called a ritual of being. And his latest works were cast off supports like crutches and casts that he preferred to be heavily used and dirty to reveal as much as possible their use in pursuing balance. Edmond Monciel, also his work is in the museum. During the Second World War, witnessed an execution that caused him to close himself off from the world and lived in an attic loft. After his death, over 500 of his drawings were discovered. The drawings were composed entirely of faces drawn by means of a line, which engenders faces both inside and outside of the lines. One face plays a central role, and it is the only face that looks directly at the viewer. His drawings spoke to me, especially in person. The patterns he drew seemed to be almost predetermined pathways and that perhaps depicted the movement of his thoughts, and the faces simply fell into place, just like intuition, right? As an untreated schizophrenic, mapping out these pathways may have been a way for him to as assemble a scattered identity into one that is centered. Art is social justice for how our brains work differently. This is a quote by Dr. Susan Magsiman. It can communicate an identity real or imagined telling of a state of mind that isn't trapped by biology or by its body, as it was for Edmond Monciel. Art, our art, can make a subject feel whole and feel seen. Art provides a space where people can speak not through linguistics, but through raw emotion. I remember doing that at one point in my life. I was reaching for a source of joy, like this developing figure on the left of the screen, but the pathway there was yet to be determined. 
So I listened to the patterns that occupied the empty space, still undeveloped, underneath the little girl, underneath me, essentially. And I knew instinctively how to reveal the, path, the pathways. And all of my uplifting, supportive butterflies simply fell into place, just like the faces that fell into place between these lines in Edwin Wunsiel's drawings. Listening to patterns, pulling back layers to reveal their interwovenness can be a powerful tool to uncover hidden depths of inspiration. If I were able to draw upon this screen, I could show you some of my favorite visual pathways where just my intuition kicks in and muscle memory takes over like the contour of a cheek and the way it sweeps down to the corners of the mouth and scoops under the jaw, fans along the neck and waves over the clavicle. I love, I love these, when these wonderful pathways appear and I, I love to let them just mindlessly take my hand and, and guide it without thought. Glorious Izzy Martin. Ballerina, activist, warrior against cancer who left us just less than a year ago. This is going to be her memorial. As I sculpted Izzy, those beloved familiar pathways were lost to me numerous times. I had to push myself more than usual to shift my perspective. That's something that sculptors actually do by sculpting with a mirror, for example, to see the flip side. With Izzy, I found that as I was building on the layers and the pathways would begin to reveal themselves where I might be able to go mindlessly, I felt a sense of urgency to peel the layers back again because I was looking for the soul of this young crusader. Somehow I was covering it up with the layers. I had learned a lot about Izzy. I had plenty of photos but I just needed more. And then I was given the most beautiful gift. Izzy's younger sister, Madeleine, came to the studio with their mother, Izzy's mother, and she got up on the platform next to the clay sculpture of her sister and modeled on her behalf in her sister's tutu. Christine, their mother, sat watching quietly. In life, occasionally, I find myself pulling at surface strings, ego, that pull me away from my depth. Christine, Maddie, and Izzy refocused my center, reminding me of my purpose as a sculptor and as a mother in solidarity with other mothers. Izzy's sculpture has been the most grounding experience of my career, for reaffirming my purpose as a sculptor and for reminding me to shift my perspective more often. When I put the finishing touches on Izzy's legs and feet in ballet's fifth position, I stepped away walking around her sculpture and standing at a distance, I realized that her legs were too far forward by about almost a full inch. So if I had ignored, if I had chosen to ignore this slight misalignment, it, it would have been such a distraction to any viewer for the imbalance. So I had to take a mallet hammer, hit those soft clay legs back, destroying much of my work, which I, of course, re-sculpted. So with my purpose recentered and my perspective recentered, only then could I realize Izzy's story. This is Will. To be able to tell baby Will's story, I, I needed to get to know him, his parents, his grandparents, friends of the family, and just how much they loved him and cherished every moment with him. Will's neurosurgeon, Dr. Michael Mahonen, contacted me and told me he wanted to give a gift to Will's family because Will was going to pass away soon. 
So he asked me if I could create a sculpture, and he wanted this to be done in secret. Mike, Dr. Mahonen, sent me videos, many photos, links to the family's Instagram and Facebook pages, all in a way to try to bring me into their environment so I could understand. I learned that this child was at the center of their lives, and again, all else was on the periphery, like this blanket that swaddles him. Sorry, I get choked up about Will. I think that love like this is another example of that silent language. It's a story that to is told through movement that guides us and patterns we recognize as familiar. Speaking through an ethereal blanket that holds him in perfect balance, a promise of ascension, memories preserved in ageless stars. Baby Will had become so familiar to me I had fallen completely in love with him and his family over the course of sculpting him. Mike invited me and my husband to Southern California so we could be present when he gave this gift to Will's family. When they walked into the room, I felt my knees buckle. I knew them so well. I truly loved them but I had to resist pouring my emotions out to them openly because they didn't know me. This one-sided love is powerfully grounding, and we know what happens when we're grounded. We are sturdier, more focused on the center that's holding us there in beautiful balance. So how do we my fellow artists, achieve a balance between trusting our knowledge and the trust to follow our intuition, the trust to listen to that silent language, a balance between, so to speak, rowing your boat or setting the, your, your sail to the wind. Does a refined balance between the two, is, does it become a catalyst for inspired action? I think so. For me, as a sculptor with clay, the answer includes approaching each project with a spirit of collaboration and respect, recognizing and cherishing glimpses of individual stories, glimpses of who they are when they briefly wake up, like Jorge's little patient, glimpses of their stories that are shared through family and friends, glimpses of a rare lucid moment for an afflicted mind, for example or for a guarded character who suddenly allows a moment of vulnerability. And if we're able to get more than a glimpse, how can we really collaborate to gain a better understanding of their story, their passion and their values, or essentially the identity that speaks to us in body language? And they say that eyes are the windows to the soul Metaphorically speaking, it is a view better seen behind two-way glass. To be a scientist is to discover and understand the core laws of nature. To be an artist is to treat unique lived experiences thoughtfully. To be both is how we as a species continue to invent innovate, and heal. And what remains constant, I've realized, is the purpose of those of us called to care for others, whether it be as an artist with a scalpel or an artist with clay. Thank you.